Okay, thank you very much, Gareth. So this talk, as Gareth said, is part of the, the STFC Food Network Agri-Food Innovation Webinars. So the, the second one, um, if you missed the first one, there will be a link to that as well somewhere in the talk. And if you miss anything in this one, I will also have a link to this talk. So the presentation will be made available. In fact, it is already available. So, um, so don't feel that you have to make notes as we go along or, in, or anything because all the slides will still be available. So the title of this talk is so many wor worlds there's an ill missing, so much to do. And um, it's really about data science. So I will actually try and cover quite a lot of ground at necessarily a bit high level, but uh, I will also try to go into details in a few places and look at some case studies and stuff. So we actually get some of the, the interesting details of what's happening in data science. So um, as Gareth mentioned, there's a bit of house rules that we need to go to first. Uh, I have my own set of rules as well. Um, one of them is that there will be some potentially interesting questions that I'm not allowed to answer because STFC is subject to cabinet office regulations and there are local elections coming up. And that means that there are some potentially interesting questions that I would not be allowed to talk about. This talk, I've sort of aimed for a reasonably beginner friendly kind of level of difficulty where um, I may also go into some technical bits. Uh, I will mention some more advanced topics as we go along, but it should be um, uh, reasonably audience friendly, I hope. So the STFC Food Network as such is positioned in, in some sort of overlap between STFC and, and Diamond Light Source science capabilities and food science. So we try to make use, as Gareth mentioned, of STFC capabilities to do some interesting things with food scientists. But the data science that I will talk about is, is sort of the other bit of the overlap where I'm actually not talking about data science in general, but I'm talking about data science for research. And what we really want to look at is data science for research that supports food research. So data science for food research. So this talk is sort of positioned in that overlap between STFC science and data science. So some of the things I cover are kind of research specific things. I'm, I'm sort of using science and research interchangeably in this talk. So uh, um, I'm, I'm not trying to be, um, to exclude any field of research that could legitimately use STFC scientific capabilities or data science technologies. Claire's talk, which was the first talk in this series, is positioned in the other bit of space. So um, if you missed it, there, as I mentioned, there's a link to it in this talk. Okay, I thought I would introduce UKRI for people who haven't uh, seen, although I can see there are lots of members from STFC, but in case you haven't seen anything about UKRI, you don't know much about it or STFC, then uh, I thought I would give a very quick introduction but instead of getting, giving the usual introduction, I thought I would give a brief overview of what happened with the COVID pandemic and what were the roles of the research councils in the COVID pandemic. So UKRI consists of nine different councils that you can see on the bottom left of the screen. And they have all contributed to supporting the COVID research. So um, all the councils have provided funding. Obviously, the Medical Research Council was the one with the most of the funding because that's precisely what they do. But all councils have supported the COVID research. And um, they've also, in turn, done their own research, done their own things to, to, to help. Um, uh, for example, investigate whether viruses could spread via waste from schools, whether there are any compliance issues when, when people comply or do not comply with the rules, um, what sort of communication would you need to do to address things and, and what is the virus actually doing in the body and, and all kinds of interesting things. And in fact, the very first project was started already on the 1st of February 2020, so before the lockdown. And since then, we have continued to fund lots of projects doing COVID research. Plus, of course, we've done our own research within the councils. This is roughly what the organization looks at from my perspective. So I sit at the star at the bottom, if you like. 
So STFC is one of nine councils. The scientific computing department is one of the departments within STFC. But the other departments I've listed are the other ones that also work with the STFC food network. So Rao Space, for example, will build instruments that have been used with food to, to study um, granularity of chocolate and, and other nice things. And um, Claire talked about ISIS as well as Diamond Light Source, which is not formally a part of STFC, but is also working with us on um, the food networks and also provide instruments um, and lots of other things. So where I actually sit in the department is within the data, data science and technology group. And um, you can sort of roughly see what, what the structure is of, around that. I would also like to introduce STFC for those who haven't seen STFC, and I thought I would do so using pictures rather than the usual um, background talk. So this gives us sort of flavor of what we do in STFC and the kind of people that work with, work here. And um, there, there is loads of stuff. So there are loads of interesting opportunities for using STFC technologies because it spans a vast range of of research. And even just the facilities with um, um, in turn support material sciences and medicine, chemistry, and even archaeology when they come with little bits that they want to have uh, shoot neutrons through to see what's inside. STFC's role in COVID, apart from the research that we funded, is we train people to calibrate the ventilators that were built in the beginning of the pandemic, if you if you remember. So these need to be calibrated and tested because otherwise you can't use them on, on actual people. And STFC staff trained people to do that sort of calibration testing. And we also donated our PPE and, and built PPE for other people when, when, because we could, so why shouldn't we? In scientific computing, where I sit, we have uh, process cryo-EM and X-ray crystallography. Um, so that's, there's a lot of computing required to get information out of that. So that's some, one of the things we did. Protein folding, you probably know about proteins that you need to know what the shape is before you can find out how it interacts with other things. And uh, that is done in computers because you can computers can sort of mess around with the structure until it falls into something that looks like a natural protein. And there's also a data science aspect, which is relevant to what we're going to talk about today, that how you index and share data so people can find it again. Gareth mentioned the STFC Food Network. I will go briefly through this because Gareth is going to say a few more words about this. And about myself, I am actually a mathematician. Um, I do a lot of other things, IT project management, software engineering, scientific computing. My main job actually is identity and trust for global research collaborations that I'll mention in, in, uh, somewhere else in the slides. And as Gareth mentioned, I'm also a data science champion for the STFC Food Network. So um, lots of different hats. I was previously responsible in the Greek PP project for the group that manages Large Hadron Collider data in the UK, the uh, Greek PP Storage and Data Management Group. And I've also been responsible for the group that runs the main data store where we store scientific data. So that's kind of where my data capabilities come in, the big stuff. And I will say a little bit more about the infrastructure projects that I'm working on at the moment later. But first I'll get to the traditional science because if we're talking about data science, we should look at where we start from. What is, how is data science different from normal science? So let's take a moment first to look at what normal science is. So here's a possibly simplified uh, model of traditional science where you have a hypothesis. I wonder if something, something, something. And then you go, can we design an experiment that will either show this thing or disprove it? Or have we already got data that we might use to, for, to do that? So you may have a hypothesis. I want to test in general relativity. And you design an experiment around that to try and see if you can test it or, or not. And then there's a process around that where you go through that and you get to some publication at the other end. So initially you look for the data, you find the data or you get the data if you, if you have it, then you analyze it. And if the data supports the result that you want it, then you publish it. And if it doesn't support the result that you want it, then what do you do? 
you don't really have anything to publish traditionally. I'm being a little bit facetious here because um, you may also publish negative results, I guess, but but mostly in, in all science, if you like, you needed to, to prove the thing that you set out to prove, otherwise you failed. So if you read someone's paper with their results in it and you wanted to reproduce it, then you essentially have to start from scratch. You have to redo the experiment, get to set it all up. You have to gather all the data. You have to rewrite the code that they use to analyze the results. And you have to try and, and do the same kind of stuff that they did, that they described in their paper. And that may be difficult enough, but some data is not reproducible at all like astronomy data or, or weather data. If you don't capture it now, you can't time travel back to, to, to now and capture it again. So um, yes, there, there are repetitions in weather and, and in astronomy, there are things that happen in the sky that happen again, but these are not predictable. You can't actually unfold that in an experiment. So, so the, essentially the data is not reproducible at all. Other data is precious. If we lost some of the Large Hadron Collider data, we won't. But if we did, then the physicists would be absolutely convinced that the Nobel Prize is in precisely that data that we lost. So that's why we take very great care not to lose the LHD data. And it is replicated across the world for precisely this purpose, partly to keep safe. Even if a meteor lands on a data center, it will be safe somewhere else across the world, but also because it's processed across the world and you want to have the data close to you when you process it often. So um, data is precious. We need to take good care of it. Um, then in the traditional process, you start your exploratory data analysis, and then you start maybe building a model for the data. So you may pick a generic model that suits the hypothesis that you're trying to test. You fill it in with some parameters and things, and you try to look at whether you can get those parameters defined with the data and you can test your hypothesis and you get something out of that at the other end. And you can see this is already starting to point towards a new data kind of thing, machine learning kind of thing, where if you put in a feedback loop where you look at the error and you feed it back into the model selection and the parameter selection, then you already have something that looks a bit like machine learning. So the, the quote unquote new science is in a way not so difficult from the old science. It's just better because we can do more. If science is new science, then let's look at how it's different and why we would want new science. So in the traditional math model, I kind of simplified things a little bit, starting from a hypothesis. Um, this is not always the case. Sometimes you just start with the data because you have it. Like the weather data, for example, or the astronomy data. We have astronomy data that's gathered decades ago that people are still analyzing because it's there and because we can keep working on it and find new things potentially. Or people have a new question or new idea and they go back to the old data to check it to see if there's anything supporting it in the old data. Also, we can quite simply do more because computers are faster, networks are faster, we have better storage resources. So computation can, can essentially be used across all kinds of research. So it becomes increasingly hard to find a research area that is not using computing in any way. Also, um, if you start opening up your process, so you start opening up your data, then at least you, it becomes easier to replicate because people can work from your data and get, get a, a greater impact from the data. So what comes out of the data is no longer your result, but it's also somebody else's results because they can work from the same data. So that increases the impact of the data, which in turn increases the impact of the funding that we give you to get the data. And that's what public funding will now insist on uh, that uh, if, if you make your stuff open, then we increase the impact of the funding, which is a good idea. So the impact is generated from the knowledge that we have in the data or that we gather, we gather from the data. 
and it's all about the supporting innovation, supporting research, um, and expanding things in, in different directions. Sometimes you want to um, share ideas, sometimes you want to share um, specific measurements that you had about, about some things, sometimes you want to, as I mentioned, you, you people go back and they look at the, the data to look at something new, some, some new idea, some new thing they want to test. And in general, we want to support the research life cycle so that it actually goes round in a cycle and that we can facilitate the, the cycle so that it goes faster, it goes more smoothly around in the cycle. And um, again, because of the increased capabilities we have in publishing data, publishing uh, papers, annotating things, annotating data with, with metadata and, and stuff, then we can speed up this research life cycle and actually get it get more stuff out of it. So that was a sort of very high level, very hand wavy introduction to data science and um, um, probably a bit unsatisfactory if you want to know the details. So let's look first at the data scientist as a person or what kind of skills are required. Now uh, the O'Reilly book doing data science describes a data scientist in terms of a profile that consists of these items, these attributes. Uh, they must have mathematics, statistics, machine learning, visualization, computer science, communications, and some sort of domain knowledge. In the case of the food science we do, then obviously the domain knowledge is food science. To this, I would add data management, getting data around where you need it or where, where you need to store it and, and preserve is, is also important. There's a lot of the plumbing of, of getting your compute connected to your data and getting your workflows running smoothly. Uh, there's uh, knowledge about open science, which is important when you do um, data science for science and data security as well, when you need to protect your data from being tampered with or you have sensitive data in there because people have responded with um, COVID symptoms, for example. So you need to protect your data as well. And you need to convince your ethics committee that you're test, you, you are protecting your data. So if I should try and assess my own capabilities in these areas, um, I'm probably stronger in the mathematics and statistics and, and computing kind of stuff, and correspondingly weaker in visualization and communications and obviously domain knowledge because I know very little about food science. I have worked a lot in data management over the past um, over most of my career, in fact. And uh, I know less about open science, but then I have people I can go and ask about open science. So the bottom line is whatever you profile, it doesn't really matter. But no person, no single person knows everything. So you need a team to do data science in, in general. And, and that's the point. You need people with different skills. You need people who are skilled in visualization to take part in the visualization process. And domain knowledge to say what are the things we're actually looking for in the data. And you need people who can do the plumbing, who can make sure that the data goes into the cloud when you need it and, and um, that it gets published when you need to publish it. So let's look at the publishing. So previously, when it was a result in there and a conclusion, and that was the end. And that, as we've seen, is, is not very useful if you're trying to reproduce the result and, or build on it because you haven't got the details of what happened in that process where they got to those results that they published. So we like people to publish their data. We also like them to publish their software if they write software to support their um, publications. And um, essentially, that is essential. If I review papers and I find that the authors have not done that, I send the paper back. Uh, say, you must provide a link to your software, you must provide a link to your data, otherwise I cannot accept your paper for publication. I would highlight perhaps the Software Sustainability Institute as the software.ac.uk as one of the uh, participants that have been working for a long time on getting good software qualities for science, for and, and supporting publication of software. And also the recent RSE um, Society that also supports research software engineering and, and the best practices for that. 
we like to see fair data counting as a publication. So when you publish software, when you when you publish data, it should count as a publication. When your university comes and they do the research assessment, you should cite that as part of publications. So what is FAIR data that I just mentioned? FAIR is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. It's been around since 2015 or 16 or thereabouts as a concept. The idea is that data is not very useful, useful if you can't make use of it. So you must have data that you can find that if, if I know I need data sets for a certain region for, um, and, and I need temperatures for a certain time period or something, I should be able to find that. Because in, in increasing data volumes, it can become difficult to actually find the thing that you're looking for. So the data should have sufficient metadata to enable it to be find, found when you need it. It should be accessible. It needs to be interoperable so you can actually make use of it when you get it. Because otherwise, if it's in a proprietary format that you can't make use of, then... So it needs to be... Uh, well, some disciplines use their own formats for images or, or other things. So sometimes you need standard libraries or tools to convert those. But, but generally, the point is that the data should be... When it is available, you should be able to actually make use of that using fairly standard tools to, to get into it and, and process it. So the science landscape is kind of changing along with that. There's sort of, we, we try to make people publish their data, but we also do that because there is more data. Some of the large instruments, like some of STFC instruments or, or the kind of stuff we build with telescopes and things that go out into space, they must be active for decades because they're expensive. They are, um, they require collaborations and, and, and like sending probes out into space is always a collaboration between space agencies. And we have to capture all the data from these devices. The same thing in climate data that we, we suddenly have much larger data volumes than we had before and genomics with next generation sequencing, we were suddenly able to generate sequencing of genomes at a much, much faster rate. If you look at how long it took to get the initial human genome compared to what we can do today to, to sequence the, the coronavirus, for example, um, the, it is much, much faster today. So we get much more data. Also, we get data from sensors and IoT. Increasingly, we have smart things like phones and stuff that can send data. We get long tail contributors with, um, for example, citizen science or, or hobby astronomers that sit with their telescopes and, and spot something interesting. We have unusual data sources where people mine Twitter for information, which sounds a bit... Um, uh, well, you, you make something, but at least you get a view of what's going on in, in certain circles that you can select data accordingly. You get different kinds of data that people work with, or and you get also the need to preserve the data. So the data formats that you could read 40 years ago may not be readable today because people have forgotten or, or they were they were different. The, the tools that people used were, were different. And, and if you want to make use of that data today, then, then you need to be able to get access to it and see what's in it. There is also the people where um, UKRI, for example, has highlighted the unhelpful image of the lone researcher because very often, like the data science, it's a collaborative effort. You need people with different skills working together. The Large Hadron Collider that I've mentioned a few times because I've worked with them, uh, the ATLAS experiment, if I remember rightly, consists of something like 3,000 people. So you can imagine quite a long list of authors on the, on the papers. But there's also the roles of technicians and assistants and, and um, other people, even administrators. We may curse them when they come with their forms and, uh, you know, check boxes and, and budgets and stuff. But it, they're only doing their bit, right? They're not preventing us from doing research. They're doing their bit to help us do research by 
doing the quote unquote boring bits of, of administrations of managing the budget and, and the reporting and timesheets and, and whatnot. All of this has a role in research. No person is a single genius who can work it all out. They're, it's all built on standing on the shoulders of giants and standing on the shoulders of um, past generations and at the same time working with people with different skills. Somebody sets up your lab, somebody sets up your computing, somebody sets up your data gathering and all of these people have a part in the research process and in the successful outcome of it. In particular, uh, so we, we set up grid computing, which is like um, computing as a commodity, as a utility, and cloud computing, which you're probably familiar with, with you, when you go to somebody and buy resources for a, a week or something. And those are managed by people as well, who do a lot of work to make sure that these things are, are working well, that they're secure, they're trustworthy, they perform well, and and um, they have the capabilities that you need to, to actually do your research. So in a way, it's kind of a democratization of science where you you open up stuff as well, because um, if the data is open, then anyone in principle can go and have a look. Although you probably still need a bit of domain knowledge and some statistics and stuff to actually make sense of it. But the landscape is changing and that's a good thing. You can say I mentioned already that we'd like to see more impact for them from the public funding. So if you can measure that impact, then it's even better. And if you can increase the impact by also publishing your data and your software, then it's better still. Many of the algorithms we run have been around for a long time, but we're now working on parallelization of these algorithms and we're making them faster by, uh, so it means we can do more with the same algorithms. So what was previously a data set that was too large to analyze is now within scope of analysis because we can put it into a machine that is doing it very efficiently. Also in simulations, we can do more. This is also part of the science landscape, uh, maybe not so much a data science part, but, but it overlaps with it as well. Simulations are useful, of course, when you can simulate data before you have the instrument. So with the Large Hadron Collider, for example, we, we for at least a decade, we just ran the computing infrastructure on simulated data because we wanted to make sure that it worked when, when the machine was switched on. Or we simulate things that you just cannot experiment with. You cannot go, go out and collide planets with each other. You cannot go out and, and create a black hole, um, I hope. And uh, cosmology and galaxy formation and, and stuff are things that you have to do by simulation because there's just nothing you, else you can do other than observe what, what you see and try to correlate that with your simulations. Other simulations we might do when when doing an experiment would be unethical, like um, how would it, how would the COVID disease spread if people, if we were not locked down or, or whatever, uh, that sort of stuff would be unethical to do in practice. So we can maybe do a simulation that would, um, that would give us a, an indication of what the right answer is. And the digital twin, which you may have heard about is where you have a simulated device like a jet engine, that is close model real life counterpart through sensor data. So you gather sensor data from the real life thing and you model that in the simulated thing and you use the simulated thing to predict any kind of failure that might happen in the real life thing. The other part of the process is just to make, make it more open. If I publish my data behind my research and I publish the notebooks that I used, to, to generate my results, then you can verify them, you can build on them, you can do your own stuff with them. So it's more about openness in research and, and transparency. I probably would tidy up all the mistakes I make, make along the way, so you don't have to read those as well when you read my notebooks. But um, uh, because otherwise there may be too much stuff, right? So you just want to see the, the actual process that led from the beginning to the end, what I did to clean the data, what I did to, to summarize the data, to process it and to verify 
the hypothesis or whatever, whatever, look for features, the kind of stuff that I did that you actually want to be able to see. And I can publish that via, for example, Jupyter Notebooks or some other computable format. I thought I would mention an example here. If you remember a few years ago, there was a, a lot of hoo-ha about the faster than light neutrino experiment. And that was CERN sent neutrinos to Gran Sasso in Italy and found initially that they seemed to move faster than light. And there was a lot of talk about this. And there were some people who criticized CERN for publishing that because obviously everybody knows that neutrinos cannot travel faster than light. And I think that's very wrong to do that, that, that sort of criticism. I think the good thing is to get this, the data out there and show the result because other people contributed suggestions to why we might see them moving faster than light. And it could be the moon influences the earth using its gravity so that the target station shifts very slightly compared to the, the source of the neutrinos and many other and this wasn't actually the explanation in this case, but I think that the process was good. I think CERN should be, um, uh, they did exactly the right thing in, in publishing the data and said, we found something that is odd. Lots of great science has started with something that is odd. And opening that part of the research to the rest of the world can only be a good thing. And there's more stuff there because science, lots of the science we do with the big instruments, the big things, has to be collaborative because it's more than a single person or a single institute can do. So getting lots of people looking at the data is a good thing. The astronomers, when they see a supernova, they will not sit and keep it to themselves saying, oh, I must watch this and, and I can then publish it. They will ring everyone. They will get as many people as possible to look at that supernova or comet or whatever. So more people can see it and, and, and see what, what it is, you know, more people can gather data from it. So astronomers have to share things because they can't replicate it. There is only going to be one supernova in that pre precise spot that they're looking at. So they have to share people, so share the event with other people so that others can have a look as well and get more data about it. And finally, we want to inspire the next generation. Being open about what we can do, what we know, what we don't know, helps, I think, inspire the next generation to become scientists. If you if you were a scientist when you were little and you went into your parents and said, oh, look what I found. And, and they said, well, you can't publish that yet because it's not ready for publication. Uh, that would be silly. Uh, you want to inspire the next generation by being enthusiastic about science. So we do a lot of outreach in STFC with, with schools and things. We want to inspire people to be the next generation. We want to get them to solve the problems that we can't solve because they will be the next generation of scientists. So all of that I just mentioned is because data science plays a part of that, the, the way we do data science. I thought I'd dig into a little bit data security because it's sort of my specialist topic in a, in a way for the, um, for the quiz or something. Um, I will not much detail. If you look at the data security, they will often say that the basics are confidentiality, integrity, and availability. For SDFC, the confidentiality is not terribly important because we don't hold much personal data and much of the data is going to be published anyway at some point. If it's if we do commercial work, then they typically take, take the data away with them and we don't hold it at all. So obviously then they don't have the requirement to publish their data because that requirement is only for publicly funded data that we want to increase the impact of that. Integrity, on the other hand, is king. It is the absolute thing we must in, ensure that the data is not modified in storage or in transit. And um, so we, we spend a lot of time checksumming data when it's transferred, when it's stored, when it, whenever, because we want to make sure that the data has not been modified or unintentionally truncated or some such. And there's also the availability to make sure that it's, it's available um, 
So that's why we have a lot of bandwidth as well. So we can help others um, copying data out to other parts of the country. A little bit advanced topics. Uh, while supporting the GDPR should be an obvious thing, uh, because often when you get personal data and you get people involved, you need to make sure that you support the GDPR, otherwise you won't pass, pass your ethics review. There is also the need for identity management in global research, where we want people to not have a password with our resources. We want them to use existing identities. So we have identity federations where people use their home institute identities to authenticate us. and this essentially works across the world so you can authenticate to resources in the US or Brazil or Taiwan or wherever and vice versa they can authenticate themselves to access resources in the UK and that's all because of the the way that the identity plumbing and trust networks have been put up set up so um uh, they all work together, they all do the interoperation, and they all have a comparable level of assurance. Sometimes you also want to have the, um, the, the sender of the data authenticated so you know who sent it, and maybe there's a bit of a, a part of the checksumming as well. That, and uh, uh, so you can verify that it came from a sender and it hasn't been modified in transit. And maybe there's a timestamp in there as well. Uh, people have also looked at blockchains as, as a security. Uh, sometimes people look at blockchains just for the sake of looking at blockchains, but sometimes blockchains can actually be useful as well. And there are several proposals for using blockchain in food research, which I will not go into here, but um, I, if you're interested, uh, mail me and I can send you the, some links. Also, some of the SFN projects work with um, other countries in the world. So um, there is a guidance that I should just point you at, which talks about trusted research, how you protect your IPR, IPR and how you protect your academic freedoms and various other bits and bobs. There's a link to the trusted research guidance at the end of this talk. So I want to very quick look at some of the security. Um, I wanted to keep that quick so I had more time to talk about data science in practice. So you don't normally want to worry too much about the compute, but it should all be, be available on demand, if you like, to be able to, to support um, the research. And Part of that step is also to find the usable data that you need. So this is the other side of the FAIR data where finding data is not the same as cherry picking data, but you find data and you make use of that. And um, there's a link to an XKCD cartoon, which is um, very funny. You can follow the link when you get the slides. Um, I thought I would look at a quick case study here. Um, so this is, uh, uh, Diogo's project for urban farming in Yogyakarta in Indonesia, where we're working with Indonesian collaborators. The initial data set comes in as a PDF and it's obviously not easy to, to process directly. So to get data, we want to go and um, for the geographic stuff, we may want to go to the um, OpenStreetMap and get a, a map from the region that we can work with. We may want to combine the data sets um, in particular, the PDF took a long time to clean up. We also had another data set came in, a Word document that had to be cleaned up as well. So uh, to make it user friendly, we had users put using what three words to um, give us coordinates of where they are. And that needed a quick script to call out and translate that into um, actual longitude and latitude that we could plot on the map. So it's all a matter of putting things together. The um, Alex, who is one of the collaborators, spent a long time tidying up the PDF and turning it into an Excel spreadsheet that we could actually work with. And the Word document, I sp spent a bit of time tidying that up and turning it into something that was um, that could be ingested into R and we could do some processing on it. There's always a question of tidying up stuff and, and getting it converted into something you can actually do. 
here for the visualization, I had to cheat a little bit because we don't have regional information at the right level of of resolution. So, um, so I had to essentially cheat and use images from Wikipedia of the region to actually plot the the regional units at a sufficiently low level of of detail. So. Um, the interesting bit is that user provided data can be messy. It comes in as a Word document or PDF and it needs to be tidied up before we do, we can actually process it. Data, um, a few of, there were repetitions in the data. There were um, typos in some of the things that we needed to look up. So the typos needed to be corrected and, and things. And that's not special. This is normal, this getting Geospatial data processed is another kind of interesting thing, as they say sometimes, um, spatial is special. That uh, sometimes you need special tools to manage geospatial data. And as I said, we didn't have the the right level of, of resolution. We had the the region of Yogyakarta and the city, but we didn't have the subdivisions, the subdistricts and the wards and the villages. So we had to sort of, sort of cheat a little bit and, and get that data from Wikipedia. The other kind of case study I would like to look at is imagine that you need to send me 200 gigabytes of, of data and that's from your place of work, not from your home. You obviously can't mail it to me in an email attachment and you obviously don't want to download it to your home internet because that's probably slower than the one you have at work. So what do you do? Um, particularly if, if others in your home also need the the home internet. So so what do you do when you need to, to give me, you can't just get someone to write it to a hard drive because they would need to get into the office and copy it to a hard drive and you would need to send it. So when you move data around, you need a command line mover so you can actually control it remotely. And you need to, if you control it from home, you need to, to go from your home organization to my home organization. So you want to control the transfer from where you sit for your laptop or your home computer and have the part, the, the actual data go over the fast networks in Janet. And we've got much better at doing that. We have the things called data transfer zones where, um, which the Americans call uh, science DMZs where where we have interconnects that are very fast specialized at, up to, at transferring data and and you can actually make use of those in principle uh, they can even in, in because they are very secure data transfer nodes then they can bypass firewalls because um, sometimes we find that firewalls can slow things down a lot if you need to transfer lots of data you also probably need a data mover that can control the transfer for you, particularly if you want to transfer lots of files. So you may need something with some advanced options that I've listed here. Um, these are parts of the portfolio of things that we run where we move lots of data around. The Large Hadron Collider, for example, will move something on the order of exabytes over a year, um, exabytes plural over a year. And that's all done with automated tools and restart transfers if they fail, they can do them asynchronously and do them securely and, and all kinds of good stuff. You also need to find compute resources when you try to do data science in practice. Um, you could obviously go to a commercial cloud and buy some stuff there. I have mentioned grid computing as a utility, but you'd probably need um, to make a case that you can use grid computing at all and that you are entitled to use grid computing because it's free at the point of use. So for example, um, STFC will sometimes support the projects that we fund with compute resources so that we don't get every project buying its own compute. We want to get away with that, get away from that scenario. Um, there are also obviously high performance computing and supercomputing resources if you, if you need that. Some people actually need that for doing simulations and stuff. So in the old days, people bought their own compute. They had their research proposal. They said, well, we need this to buy a computer and, and stuff and process our data. And as I said, we want to get away from that. We want to get away from people doing their own stuff. It would be much better if it was done 
in by, by topic at least so bioscientists would work together with their own compute resources and physicists would work together with their own resources and environmental scientists would do their stuff uh, so that's a kind of thematic grouping of of doing resources and sometimes that's the right way to do to do it but even better is, is if they can all share the same compute infrastructure so that's where the notion of e-infrastructures comes in and it's been developed over quite a long time and um, uh, they are very mature as well they are often free at the point of use if you can justify your use of those resources uh, or they may be paid for through your research grant or, or some such um, so on our compute resources at STFC for example we can make opportunistic use of a compute cluster if somebody says, uh, well, we need 40% of your compute cluster and we allocate it to them. If they don't use those 40%, then we can put somebody else in and they can make use of it. So we operate our clusters at near 100% utilization. And then when the other guys come back and say, no, actually we do need our 40%, then we can sort of gradually put, push the others out so they get the 40% that they were promised. So collaboration again is, is essential to, to get optimized use of compute and storage resources. Here are some examples. In the UK in the past, we had the National Events Program. Uh, we have the National Grid Service. We now have um, international ones that we're working with, such as EGI, EU that focuses on data. The European Open Science Cloud is one that I work with as well as uh, there are others across the world. I've just put some examples in that you can look at when you, when you get the slides. You also have the repository where you can put your data. Again, there are several options. Many research organizations will have their own data repositories or there will be domain specifics like the compute ones I mentioned before. They're also dom sometimes domain specific data repositories. Uh, there are various other places. People put data in Zenodo in EU that um, EGI has a data hub and, and there are lots of other places where you can put data. STFC has a, uh, several repositories as well. You also want the metadata to make it findable. Uh, we'll probably say something about the quality assurance behind the data um, and whether the data can be changed when you find more data, or whether you add to the data set um, and what precisely was used when you generated your results. So maybe you want to address parts of your data set and, and can you verify what sort of steps were done when you, when you did that? So you need to talk about these things when you do stuff, when you do science, data science. So when you write your proposal, you must have a data management plan and they're not hard to do. The Digital Creation Center has got guidance on how to do a data management plan and every proposal should have one. You are much more likely not to get funded if you don't have a data management plan. Turning that around, you're more likely to get funded if you have one. And the same goes for the software as well. I put a link into to Neil's paper about reusable software, but there are lots of guide and have probably. The same thing about software engineering, which is part of the output. Um, again, uh, research software engineers can help with um, the best practices for doing this and reusing software as much as possible is, is a good thing. So I am just going to rattle through some modern stuff at the end. Um, IoT and edge computing is quite a popular topic. Um, I will return to this later in the talk. There's um, a case study here though that I just wanted to dive into. Um, the, it, it's actually based on aquaculture, so it is in a pond, um, putting sensors into a pond to be able to gather data about the water quality and whether you need to do something to the water to make, um, uh, to make it more suitable for uh, prawns in this case. So you actually want to gather data from the individual sensors and send them to some sort of local node that, that does the processing and alerting. And then it sends data off to the cloud so the scientists can process that later. So that's very much an edge to cloud computing where we increasingly find that the edge can be smarter, that we can put more computing abilities into the edge of the 
the devices. And they're very easy to prototype with Arduinos and, and Raspberry Pis and things because they're easy to get and they're easy to interface to things and they're easy to program. So quite often I find myself building prototypes with Arduinos or some such. And um, then later, if it becomes an actual product, we can look at doing it in a more um, a less prototypey way, but we get a long way with the Arduinos and, and, and similar devices. Um, I'll skip through this. And there's the related ability of what Cisco called fog computing, which is where you have a more distributed mesh of computing abilities. So you have some computing abilities at the very edge and some more abilities uh, as you get closer to um, the cloud, architecturally speaking. You may want to calibrate things that so, um, you may want to go out and every so often and you put your sensors into calibration mode and you want them to be um, not sending data to the cloud at that time because obviously you're calibrating, you're not making actual measurements. You want to scale it up. Once you have your data, you want to sort of explore things by hand. You want to select your features that you're looking for and then you want to go to a larger scale. This is also part of the modern challenges. As I said, we can do more, but it's not always easy. If you need to do things by hand, then this is where machine learning comes in. You have humans do stuff through citizen science or through students or something. And then you teach machines to do that and eventually machines will take over. But the point is that the interfaces that the humans have and the point and the interfaces that the machines have are very different. So there's a transition of the underlying software between going from human processing to machine processing that needs to be done. There's something about ethics and AI as well, since we're talking about machine learning. Um, I will skip through this because we are running out of time. You may also want to have the workflows. Um, modern cloud service providers will give you tools to build workflows. But in my experience, it's very often about plumbing, getting things connected to each other. There are some other topics that I don't have time to go into or standards, which I also don't have time to go into. So um, this is the food, set, food network slides about food um, and data, data science, how they connect to each other, as well as other STFC technologies. My take on that is looking for patterns that are common. We have the multidisciplinary data and knowledge representation. We have data from different sources that we need to put together and combine. We have the smart sensor networks like we saw with the sensors in the pond. We have uh, marketplaces for managing, connecting producers and consumers of products and managing the supply chain in between and we have the data security applications. These are the four basic patterns that I have seen in, in several projects. Several projects also want to build mobile applications. Um, there are ways of doing that. I think in, in since we have very little time with these kind of things, I would actually be prefer to just prototype things using existing apps. But um, sometimes there are, um, there's a case for building a new app. For, to support some sort of workflow. There's also a, a pattern of managing expectations. If you get your data science um, ideas from Hollywood, where they, at the flick of a wrist, can swirl a hologram around, then that's not how it works in practice. In practice, things are often much less glamorous and much harder to do. It is true that some things are easy, but many of the plumbing things can be quite hard to do. So rounding up, if you want to work with STFC or with scientific computing department in particular, here's a quick list of our capabilities. Um, they have links, many of them, so you can get to um, find more information about these things. And here are the general references. In particular, the one in the middle is my talk. So you can go and look up the talk. And uh, if I rattled quickly through the slides, you can go and read them at your leisure and print them out and hand them to your grandchildren, framed, put them on the wall, all that sort of stuff. Thank you very much.